I found a dead squirrel and I took it up to my bedroom and was caught by my parents at about 15 skinning it, which horrified them. But I explained, you know, and they really understood then, I knew you as well, because I was finding dead, you know, skulls and feathers and what have you. Um, and actually, because I'd read a, read a book called Practical Taxi Derby by John Moyer and basically followed the steps and actually was quite pleased with the end result. And that just said to me, I've got to know more. It was then an, a thirst to keep searching out the knowledge for it. The word taxidermy literally is taken from a Greek origin and means to, to manipulate skin. And that way it could include leather work, you know, making shoes or something. Um, but we think of taxidermy as being stuffed animals. And so I think it's better to have a definition that says that taxidermy is the preservation of skin, for a start, stuffing it with something to replace the, uh, the muscles and bones and sloppy bits that have been taken out from inside, and that you've set it up in some representation of life. You're trying to represent the living animal. So those three components are what we would recognise as being a definition of taxidermy. It all began really probably five or six hundred years ago with the, the big voyages of discovery, you know, people going around the world trying to find out what wonderful things there were. You, you, you have the opportunity to bring back to this country all sorts of wonderful things that nobody ever saw here. And some of the uh, rich collectors set up these so-called cabinets of curiosity in which you see um, dried fish, for example, and early, early examples of, of stuffed birds. So that, that's, it began like that, as, as a way of um, studying and uh, cataloguing, if you like, the world's treasures. The cabinet of curiosity, or also known as the Wunderkammer or Wunderkabinet, has to be in a room rather than a piece of furniture. Essentially originated as a room full of stuff that belonged to a nobleman or a scholar, uh, usually to show how great they were or what, how great their knowledge was. And this room was meant to represent the entire world in microcosm. So you'd have uh, elements of natural history, normally represented by taxidermy, or you'd have uh, minerals, you'd have religious iconography, you'd have ethnographic art, uh, and to represent the world. And eventually those pieces became the beginnings of the modern museum. Uh, so, you know, most of the modern museums that we know now are originated on one person's collection. <laughs> Follow me. Part of this whole authenticity thing. Everything is virtual now and people uh, don't want to be virtual. People in, or spend their entire times in the virtual world so they want their actual world to be extra specially actual. So there seemed to be um, you know, a real interest in uh, having unique things and it's nothing, you can't have anything more unique than a piece of natural history because even if you buy two crows those two crows are unique. And maybe this, you know, is part of the Wunderkammer thing again. They're kind of trying to build Wunderkammers in their own homes again, to try and have the whole world in their room again.
I was at uh, art school for a while, but I'd done biology only to A level and I was just totally fascinated. And as a kid, I used to spend every possible hour in the Natural History Museum. I was always interested in art and wildlife. There we go. Right, antlers. One skin, one skull. Uh, I'm going to put that in the freezer now because it's a warm day. I don't know to leave things out too long. Um, here we've got someone who found a green woodpecker. I skinned it. That's the skin frozen, ready for the next stage. Um, this is basically packed with things in various stages. This is a Chinese water deer skin that I've got to do the mannequins for, ready for taxidermy. I do note everything before it goes in. Here we've got, uh, I don't know what that is. Oh, it's a pheasant. Um, and here we've got That's uh, a moor hen. Oh! First ever, my first ever piece, apart from drying out pigeons and whatnot. Oh! It's been kept under cars and things and in gardens because it's because I didn't take any of the guts out because I didn't know that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> Um, it smells. There he is. So this is Fox in a Box. It's been like this for about three years, four years. Um, it's amazing that if you, if you get an animal and there's no light, there's no water, there's no animals that eat it, things will last for, for ages. They can last forever. Um, so there's no special techniques at all, just salt and shake and back and um, a good sturdy suitcase. <laughs> it was the strangest sensation cutting into a creature that was so recently living, like being so close to life and death at the same time was, was so moving. Like this is a living creature, it's, it's magical. Animals are magical, they're beautiful, they're fascinating. And I didn't know this until I got inside of life. It's very, it changes you. It changes you if when you op open a creature up that was living and it's perfect and it was it's made so incredibly. Your whole the head space changes, you, you change. It was, it was ridiculous, I've never been more moved in my life and that compelled me to carry on. I was fascinated, absolutely fascinated. I still am. I found I always preferred building something 3D as opposed to a 2D picture. This is quite nice stuff because I can carve it. I'm going to start shaping this into the shape of this bird. You've got to be able to see what that specimen is in front of you and recreate it through your hands. That said, I have got a ream of anatomy books, which is always giving me information as to where it is. everything is relevant to the specimen. Right, so I'm going to start shaping this into the actual shape. And the nice thing about this is, if I'm looking at this, um, this body, once I'm at this stage, the neck will fit in the back, the crop is in there, so I V out the crop, put the definition I'm putting into where the chest muscles go. And then because this is oversized, I've allowed it oversized, so I can then indent it to put in the definition of where the legs are. Wire goes through it for the for the neck. And this is what I use for all fish bodies. Is if I'm carving on a fish body, this is just like a little replica of a tench, I then can eventually carve everything into it. Head carved out for the uh, depression where the gill plates are fit, 
carved in there where the front fins are fit. So I've got this and if I put you on there, you can see I can actually start putting shape into this. So I can curve it. And how I relate that to how that fish will look is I can actually, if I've done in the past, is get a fish, dead fish that was found or given to me, freeze it, slice it on a bandsaw, and then I can look at cross sections and get the exact shape so I know what I've got to recreate. Um, Walter Potter was a self-taught taxidermist in Sussex. Quite early on, he, he began to recreate the, the famous children's poem of, of the death of Cock Robin. You know, who, who, who killed Cock Robin? I said the sparrow in my bow and arrow. And what he did was to represent all the characters in the poem with actual stuffed animals. And he made this tableau over a space of about seven years and, and then supplemented it with other things like the rabbit school, recreating the kind of school that he himself had gone to. And there's a squirrels club and a rats club and the kittens tea party. And, and this, this became uh, what Walter Potter was best known for. And, um, and that's the kind of thing that some people think is very twee and amusing. Other people think it's very naughty and disgusting. Well, the skin went in a um, acid pickle solution uh, for 24 hours. Uh, I don't use the old, um, in the old days we used to use phenols and sulfuric acids, uh, but nowadays we buy a specially developed what they call a safety pickle for the taxidermy trade, and it seems to work beautifully. Um, so the skin comes out and will be fleshed off with a knife or, as I say, my hand fleshing machine, which is has a circular blade on it and through compressed air we'll slice it down. Right, we'll get some adhesive onto the skin. This point here, this is what fits between the antlers and the top. Taxidermy is an art, you know, it's, it's a craft, it takes years to perfect, people are really into it, they want to make things perfect, like taxidermists preserve the illusion of life, that's what they want, they want things to be perfect, they want it to be pure, they want it to be natural, they want it to be realistic, as I am more interested in the reality of death, you know, the things that we don't see, the things that are hidden, um, I, that's what I'm interested in, I, I like to show people, the things that they haven't seen before, not necessarily really want to see, but you've got to take responsibility for your actions. They deserve more than to be left in a skip to rot after they have been stripped of their useful parts. They deserve more than that. Life is the most precious gift of all and shouldn't be needlessly wasted. Once I've got the, the head, the, the eyes in and I've got a, it might look with a bit of character with just one ear pointing back a bit, just to, you know, oh, it's, it's, it's alert, but it's heard something behind.
So I'm going to curve in some, some clay. Again, this is a crucial part of the taxidermy because setting the eye has got to be the first thing you focus on is the eye and you've got to see that this looks right. Okay, I had a really good pin which has disappeared. It's my eye modelling pin. Solid. Well, otherwise known as a hat pin. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. For us, eyes are really tremendously important because they're a part of the way that we communicate with each other and, and we understand animals when we look at them, we look at their face, their eyes. Eyes are really important to us. So when you look at the eyes of a stuffed animal, if they're wrong, um, you know they're wrong. Um, even if you're not a specialist, you can feel there's something kind of wrong. We're all familiar with what animals should look like <laughs> because we see them on television and that's how you recognise old taxidermy in museums that's not kind of really up to it. A common fault is to have too much stuffing in there and people sort of stuff the thing with straw or cotton wool or something and the animal kind of balloons out. Um, whereas, of course, live mammals uh, have the, the skin often hanging in folds, particularly things like, say, elephants or, um, or, or something like a bulldog. Many of the taxidermists would be setting up things they'd never seen alive. You know, um, they'd be working with dried skins, m maybe badly shriveled or badly preserved. You know, it's quite difficult for them to know how to do things. And so you would often get animals set up in, in postures that are actually anatomically impossible, simply because the poor old taxidermist didn't know any better. <laughs> and that isn't what modern taxidermy is all about. The best stuff is so good that um, uh, it's, it's actually difficult sometimes from photographs to see whether an animal is actually alive or not. And that, of course, is what taxidermists have been striving for for hundreds of years, to try and recreate life so accurately you can't tell whether the animal's alive or dead. I'm the manager of the design and conservation team. Um, and I look after, uh, and my team look after all the permanent galleries in the museum, and we also get involved with temporary exhibitions as well. Taxidermy comes in and out of fashion, and particularly in the 1970s and 80s, um, sort of audio visuals and films and interactives played a much bigger part in how museums displayed their specimens. So taxidermy sort of fell out of popularity. Um, now it's, it's completely different. I think it's, all, it's back in vogue and I think that's partly due to um, artists like Damien Hirst and uh, Gunther von Hagen. Um, his Animal Body Worlds exhibitions around the world have been extremely popular. A piece of taxidermy is real and you get a real sense of what the animal is like. In fact, the museum's policy is changing in that we are now doing much more specimen-rich exhibitions. So um, we're putting more taxidermy back in, in our galleries, and permanent galleries, and in our temporary exhibitions we actually commission bits of taxidermy, but only of domestic animals and um, very common wild animals. So, and they're small mammals usually like hedgehogs or rabbits, mice, um, and they have to be certified that they've died a natural death, really. <laughs> My favourite piece is a slightly quirky piece in the bird gallery in the anatomy case and it's the head of um, an owl and it has a blue pencil sticking out of its ear um, which I assume is to show where its ears are because it's very difficult to tell on an owl so I mean it's slightly quirky but I, I think it's really sweet. <laughs>
good. That's called that's called quick taxi dirt. Yeah. <laughs> you know this is what the animal looked like when it was alive sorry you can't go and see the real thing (laughs) 